so talking about uh, PISA, so it's 15 year olds, we've got assessments, we've got surveys, a lot of different countries involved, a lot of data to look at gender differences. So uh, let's go. Um, this was a lot of work on this was published in uh, March this year, I think, in this OECD report, which uh, drew a lot on uh, gender differences uh, and uh, PISA data, but also, am I standing too near something? Okay. Um, uh, but also on uh, other sources of evidence, so I, I can't review everything that's in here, but if you want to see a report with an enormous amount of stuff on gender differences quantified in different ways, then uh, there's certainly plenty in there to look at. So, one of the opening statements of this report was that new gender gaps in education are opening. So let's just see what's meant by this. Here is an old gender gap. So this is uh, some data looking at percentage of a population that have got a degree over time, and it starts way back at the end of the 19th century up to the 1980s. So a long time ago, back at the end of the 19th century, very few people in a population would have a degree, and particularly very few women. Over time, it's increased, and there's a, a more of a difference, uh, more people getting a degree, but the gender gap uh, remained in place till the 1950s. But then within 10 years, that gender gap disappears and uh, changes the other way, with more women having degrees than, than men. But PISA gives a, a lot of divs. That's an older gender gap, and we've seen how that can change quickly. PISA measures a lot of different things, and I'm just going to run through. I've got seven slides that are like this, just showing some of these uh, different things that can be measured by PISA. This one is actually about the biggest gender gap that you can find anywhere in any of the PISA questions. It's about how, how much do you play online collaborative games? Okay, so you're on a computer and you're playing with other people across the internet. And uh, what you find is you've got all, each, from these charts, each square is a country. Um, if you want to play along and look up for particular countries, then uh, some uh, important ones. QCN is Shanghai, China, if you want to look at them ever. Uh, who else would be there? Singapore, SGP, if you want to look at them. Um, I hope you can work out quite a lot of the others. Britain are GBR when they're on here. They're not on this chart because we didn't do this part of the survey. Okay, but uh, as you can see, we've got all these countries here. Every single one of them, you have around 40% of boys saying, yeah, I play almost every day, play an online collaborative game. In every country, about less than, tends to be less than 10%. Of, of, of girls saying the same thing. So one way to sort of summarise that would be to say boys 43, girls nil, although that isn't taken to imply this is necessarily a good thing, and there's just the summary of the uh, percentages within the OECD. So that's one sort of gap in behaviour, and indeed the biggest one in the PISA data. Immediately, the question is, well, what are, what are girls doing in their spare time? And the reverse effect is found if we look at reading for pleasure. So if we look at oh, all these countries... We find that um, every, all the countries except for three, boys become less likely to say they read for at least an hour a day because they want to, um, not because they're being forced to, not for schoolwork, this is for pleasure, uh, uh, than girls. There's only three countries that buck this trend. They're Japan, Korea, and Hong Kong. And in those countries, that's somewhat fueled uh, by a reading of comics, which are very popular. There. If I was to instead look at um, just reading fiction, then every country would say girls uh, are doing this more than boys. If we move on also, also perhaps a, a more sort of worthwhile activity than playing computer games, the amount of time spent um, playing, uh, doing your homework for at least an hour a day, or, or rather it's actually seven hours a week. You do at least seven hours of homework a week. So if we look at this one, we get... Uh, it's 66-2 in favour of girls, again, more likely to be doing homework. The only exceptions are Albania and Vietnam. Everywhere else, uh, big differences. Moving on. This is a more worrying one. This is about agreeing that school has been a waste of time. Now, I've put it as girl, a boy's uh, 68... Is it girls nil? Yes. Girls <laughs> nil in this one. Um, I've put it like that, but obviously it's, it's, a, it's a bad thing in terms of, uh, of boys. So every country that we look at, girls tend, boys tend to be about twice as likely to agree with the statement, school has been a waste of time compared uh, to girls. 
And this is true across all the different countries. So it's true if you look at Shanghai, uh, where is it down there? It's also true if you look at Finland, another high performer. They're particularly true there. Some of the biggest differences are in countries like Emirates, that's A-R-E, Jordan, and Qatar. But it's, you know, it's equally true in the high performers. Also true, you know, if we were to pick out, uh, let's say, uh, who should we go for? Uh, no, not quite, Germany. There. So a country where you know, they've got this high esteem vocational education, even there we get about 16% of boys agreeing that school is a waste of time, has been a waste of time. Interestingly, this is one of the places where Britain performs particularly well. In Britain, only around about 8% of boys say that school has been a waste of time. Britain is actually fourth in terms of boys um, not thinking school is a waste of time. So actually, in those terms, Britain does quite well. OK, last three, um, just looking at attainment. For all of these, I'm going to look at percentage of students achieving level four in the PISA tests. Level four, very roughly equivalent to a GCSE grade B. It's, so it's quite a high level of achievement. I've picked there, because if I'd gone lower, um, Shanghai, China just gets 100% and everything, and it's less interesting. So I went for a level four uh, there. So in this one, most countries, boys slightly outperform girls. If you look at this level of achievement in science, if you look at different levels, the story does change. Okay, but as you can see, if you look at all those charts, generally they're pretty flat. The difference is pretty small. If we look um, the actual, and the, across the OECD, average percentage difference is only 2%. So level, for science, things are pretty easy, uh, pretty even uh, in, uh, in PISA. For maths, the difference becomes a little bigger. Also, more countries where boys are outperforming girls in this kind of maths. So it should be noted if you look at different ways of measuring maths, like from TIMS or from our own national assessments in GCSEs, you don't get the same pattern. This is a, it's within this particular form of the way uh, maths is measured. It has a lot to do with um, looking at word problems and converting them back into maths and then solving the problem rather than reproducing stuff you've learnt as part of the curriculum. So it is different to other assessments, but in these ones, boys do tend to outperform girls, with the only exceptions, I think they're quite slight exceptions, being, uh, there's one, Singapore is one, let me see if I can remember the others. One is uh, Iceland, is there, and the last one is Thailand, there. So other than those three countries, boys uh, tend to outperform girls at this level. But the biggest difference in attainment comes in reading, where girls universally outperform boys every single country uh, on the planet. And this includes you know, high performers uh, as, as well as uh, low performers, you know, like Albania, something like that, up there. And it's a bigger difference than we see for maths. And actually, when you put this, not in terms of percentage achieving a, a particular level, but in terms of PISA point scores, average difference is close to 40 points which is um, interpreted as being worth a, as a year of, uh, of schooling, on average, difference in attainment. So the biggest difference is in reading. So report starts to look at um, why you see these differences and starts to investigate them more. And one of the first statements made is that in top-performing countries, girls perform on a par with their male classmates in math. So in other words, if you are in a high-performing country, then you are not gonna, you're not going to see these differences. If only you were any good at maths, you wouldn't get these uh, gender differences. So I just want to start by uh, knocking that on the head. This is not true. OK, so here is a chart to demonstrate that. So along the x-axis here, this is your overall PISA math score. They're in hundreds of points, but it's you know, sort of... Every block here will be just over a year of progress is the idea in terms of how well people do. You've got Shanghai up the top here and Peru down the bottom here. Now on the y-axis I've got points difference in terms of uh, gender. So what is the difference between the average points achieved by boys, average points achieved by girls? This is a little different to the chart earlier because it's now just about average points rather than getting level four or the grade B. So you've got a few more countries down here, below this solid line where girls outperform boys, up here, 
most countries, boys outperform girls, and the dotted blue line is the OECD average amount of difference. Now, what you've got here is quite a lot is made of the fact that Shanghai, China, sorry, I should also say, you've got these lines here. We've also got a confidence interval on the gender difference for each country, just giving you the idea of the precision of how well the gender difference has been estimated. So quite a lot is made of the fact that Shanghai, the top former, the difference between boys and girls is not significantly different from zero. So, okay, so in the top performing jurisdiction, boys are doing just as well as girls. However, the thing to note is that it is also not significantly different from the OECD average, so we can't make too much of that. Furthermore, although we see if we go down in terms of performance, Singapore, there's a low uh, gender gap at this level. It doesn't, if you quantify this in different ways. It has, if you look at the very bottom end of the distribution, you have girls doing a lot better than boys, very big gender gap. So although you've got a small gap there, if you look a little further down, Hong Kong, Korea, Japan, all of those have bigger gender gaps than the OECD average. So in other words, there is no big trend for the highest performing countries to have the smallest gender gaps. It's just not true that being a high performing country means that you won't get a difference between boys and girls. So let's move on. One of the other, so the next the OECD report goes to look at particularly underperformance of boys, but particularly in reading. And it looks at the differences in free time, computer games, homework, reading, some of the things we looked at earlier, and says, OK, let's look at how much these can explain differences in, uh, in performance between boys and girls. And, it and you can actually get the data and work through um, some of these explanations. So like I said earlier, in the OECD, we tend to have a, a, we tend to have a 38 point gap between how well girls perform how well boys perform on average. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap for individuals. Okay? So about a, about a year's worth of progress, girls outperforming boys. What you can then do is say, well, how much difference? We know boys like school less than girls. What would happen if boys were just as happy at school as girls? What if we compared boys who think school is a waste of time to girls who think school is a waste of time? And we think boys who don't think school is a waste of time, who think school's useful, to girls who think something's useful. If we can get people with the same attitude, does that get rid of this gap? And if you do that analysis, you find it doesn't get rid of the gap. You find it only explains, only reduces the gap by about four points. You've got a 38 point difference, it only gets rid of about four of those. Similarly, if you look at video games, video games is often picked out as being a really bad thing and uh, really damaging people's progress. So you know, boys are playing more. Maybe that's the reason they're so terrible at reading. Um, but again, you can do the same thing, because obviously there are lots of girls who play video games, and you can compare boys who play video games, girls who play video games, boys who don't, girls who don't. And if you do within-group comparisons, again, even if they're all playing video games just as much, the same gap is there. It's only five points smaller by taking account of video games. Do the same thing with homework, boys who do homework just as much as girls. It does a, has a bit more effect, but only reduces the gap by eight points. So it's not just these little things that are causing the, uh, the gender gap. By the way, don't add these numbers together. Um, they interact together. You might be doing less homework because you're doing more video games and so on. So you can't add those up and get, what do we get, 17. Um, and, uh, and indeed, they're actually measured in different surveys somewhat. So. It makes it difficult to uh, sort of a cumulative effect. But one thing that's focused on a lot is uh, reading for pleasure. And we'll look at that a bit more here. So here is um, looking at the distribution of reading scores in the UK. I've used box plots. If you're not familiar with this, just focus on the rectangles in the middle. The lower part of the rectangle is a 25th percentile. The top is the 75th percentile of attainment. And the middle is the median. So it's just an easier way of looking at uh, the distribution of scores and how it varies between boys and girls. As you can see, this is just within the UK for illustration. Uh, in the UK, girls outform boys by about 24 points, so it's a bit less. In fact, I didn't say this earlier, the gender gap in reading for, uh, in the UK is one of the smaller ones. So we worry a lot about underperformance of boys <coughs> in the UK, but it's actually less than a lot of other countries. Um, but here it's about 24 points. Now again, this next chart does what I was talking about. We split this chart, still comparing boys and girls, but we split it by how much 
they choose to read uh, fiction uh, because they want to in their own time. And so we're comparing on the left-hand side there people who say, I never read fiction because I want to, and compare boys and girls. And on the right-hand side, we've got people who read fiction at least several times a week just because they want to, again, boys and girls. The more you read fiction for pleasure, uh, the better your performance is. So it's, as you would expect, you're better at reading. And if you look within those groups, you find that the, uh, the gender gap is much smaller than it was. It's gone from 24 points to 8 points within these groups. So it sort of looks like it implies, OK, this might be an explanation for why girls do better than boys. It's just because they, they read more. So that could be an answer. So, and you can do the same uh, analysis over whole of the uh, OECD, same thing I just did there. Um, and in fact, it, it explains uh, 17 uh, of the 38 point gap it can be explained by reading fiction. If you go further and use more questions and build up a factor score about reading enjoyment, that goes up a little bit to 22 points. So, as we look at this, we've got video games, homework, attitude to score, they all, part, they all play a little bit of a part. The extent of reading for pleasure does seem to give a stronger link, but is left with this uncertainty about which way is the causality. Is it that if we just made everyone read more, they would become better at reading? Or is it the other way around, that people who read more are reading more because they are already better at reading? Is it the wrong way around? So you can't tell from this. Would it eradicate the gender difference if only we could get young boys really interested in reading, get them into the right kind of fiction, have the right things in class? You can't tell from this analysis whether it would eradicate it. And also, if you think back to earlier, you've got countries like Japan and Korea, where boys already read just as much as girls, and yet you still see the same sort of size of gender gap. So is reading... Is reading the answer, is it not? This was a quote from the OECD report. Talks about how um, females tend to outperform boys in, in reading tasks, but notes why this is so remains a mystery. We don't know the answers, and uh, we shouldn't pretend that we do. Even if we did agree with this prognosis, so it's all about how much they read, you've still got to answer the question, why, why do girls read more than boys? Tons of fiction out aimed at boys. Why, why, why does this happen? So, a lot of questions left unanswered. Next part. Uh, OECD says girls have less confidence than boys in their ability to solve maths or science problems. Okay, but I'm going to focus on, on maths for this bit. This is very evident. So there's a lot of questions go into this about, you know, how confident would you be solving different types of problems? It goes through different things. I'm just showing you three quick ones here. Girls less likely to say that they learn mathematics quickly, more likely to agree, almost half of them agreeing with the same, I'm just not good at mathematics, and over a third agreeing, I feel helpless with a mathematics problem. Now, and, and uh, boys less likely to say those things. And again, you can do the same analysis of, of the same type we saw earlier. Let's if we were to compare maths performance between boys and girls with similar levels of confidence, we can easily show that if they've got the same level of confidence, girls do just as well as boys, at least as well, possibly better. Okay? But um, does that tell us what to do from a policy perspective? So there is some research out there that shows um, that if you can improve the confidence of girls in mathematics, or what's called academic self-concept, so they believe that they can do the problems, it does help. So that's perfectly fair enough as a teaching strategy. But again, you can't know whether that would be enough to eradicate the, uh, the problems because, uh, or, the, or the gender gap because you, you don't know whether in this analysis whether girls are having more confidence because they're good at maths or whether they are better at maths because they have more confidence. It's the direction is uncertain. And another way to think about this link is shown in this next chart. So this shows, so I've got three countries here, Shanghai, Singapore, United Kingdom. On the x-axis, I've, I've put PISA scores just in terms of the percentage of the questions they're asked. They generally ask 30 to 40 
questions. What percentage of them did they get correct? Of the maths questions, did they get correct? And then y-axis is what percentage of them, sort of a fitted model, what percentage of them would have uh, still agreed with the, center, with the statement, I'm just not good at maths. So in the UK, as you can see, the more questions you're getting correct, the less likely you are, you think you're not good at maths, fair enough. But given the same performance, so here, same performance, even very high performance, girls are more likely to say, I'm just not good at maths than boys. Same thing is true in Singapore. Now this is interesting because Singapore is a country where even at a population level, girls outperform boys in mathematics. There shouldn't be any reason for girls to think they're not good at mathematics. But again, you've seen the same effect. Then sort of most uh, shockingly perhaps, you look at Shanghai, China. So here, you can even find girls who have got every single question right. All the P's of question, they've got them all right, but still, amongst that sort of group, we're saying about a third of them got the whole question right. Oh, I'm no good at mathematics, and they've got the whole thing right. Sort of funny, it is kind of funny, but it's sort of sad as well about uh, why, why would that be the case, that girls would have less confidence? And why would they, you know, it's quite a strong statement, just not good. It's not saying it's not my strength. It's quite a, a strong statement, okay. Finally, last bit, let's look at science. So this was a statement that I found was quite a controversial statement to put in an OECD report. It said, girls appear to underform considerably when they are required to think like scientists. Okay, now it's partly, this is based on lower performance in maths. So that's partly what that statement is related to and they think of maths as being one of the tools of the sciences. But it's also partly related to um, some results in the science test themselves, which were last a sort of major area of research for PISA in 2006. Now, as we saw earlier, overall in science, boys and girls perform pretty similarly. Okay, there's not much difference. However, when you look at particular subscales within the PISA test, you get some differences. So we've got three here. We've got identifying scientific issues, explaining phenomena scientifically, and using scientific evidence. We'll look at more what those mean in a minute. In the identifying scientific issues scale, girls outperform boys by about 17 points. If you look at the explaining phenomena scientifically scale, boys outperform girls by about 15 points. On the uh, using scientific evidence uh, scale, fairly similar. So what I wanted to know was what exactly does this mean in terms of what girls can do? And in order to do that, I needed to look at the exact questions that were, that were being used to assess this. And there aren't very many released. PISA is mainly um, kept secure. They don't give out the items afterwards. But there's a small number you've got. So in the identifying scientific issues, there are eight questions that have been released and are publicly available. And actually, if you look at the results on those eight questions, in all eight of those questions, girls outperform boys. On the explaining phenomena scientifically, there are 11 questions released. And on those, um, boys outform girls on six items, girls outform boys on five. So it doesn't quite fit with what we'd expect in the findings here. However, although some of those five is pretty close, they're actually very close, but there's some where the boys outform girls by quite a lot. So let's have a look at some of these questions and what they actually mean and what they look like and whether they fit with this girl's struggle to think like scientists statement. Okay, so here is a identifying scientific issues question. Where it starts, it's got quite a long bit of text. I've only given the sort of start of it. It starts with a long sort of, I think it's a newspaper article about intelligent clothes. Okay, so they're gonna give people the power of speech and it has a whole load of um, uh, writing about you know, the claims of what these clothes are gonna be able to do. And then the question is, can these claims made in the article be tested through scientific investigation in the lab? And the answer is either yes or no. So obviously, whether they can be washed without being damaged, the answer would be yes, you could test that. You could wash them and see whether they're damaged in the lab. And you can go, and go yes for some of the others. And then, can they be mass-produced mass cheaply? It's not something you can test in the lab. So you get that. Uh, so the answer is no. So, and when you look at this, uh, the, the percentage of boys and girls getting this correct across uh, Across the OECD, you find that uh, 
Uh, about 51% of girls get this correct, so I've represented that as 51 Marie Curies in a class of 100, and boys, 45% of that get that right, 45 Einsteins in a class of 100, because they can answer this question. Okay, so, and, then, and this is typical, girls outperforming boys on this type of question, and indeed, if you look across all of the eight, some of them are longer and more complicated to put up, it, even, they're all more, they're all complex questions about how should experiments be set up? What can be tested scientifically? What's the point of control groups? Why do you do this in this experiment? And on all of those questions, girls tend to outperform boys you know, a little bit. Um, so in that sense, does that sound like not thinking like scientists? I don't know. Okay. Here's one where, this is actually the one where boys outperform girls the most. And this is one of this explaining phenomena scientifically scale. And the question is just, why do you breathe more heavily when you're doing exercise, okay? And there's two, either, you can either say it's because you need more oxygen, or you can say because you need to get rid of carbon dioxide. Either of those are acceptable, you get the mark either way. And boys um, outperform girls by about nine percentage points. Now, when you look through these questions, when, it, when you look at the OECD's explanation of what explaining phenomena scientifically means, it's quite a long explanation about you know, predicting change and using your scientific knowledge and all this stuff. When you look at the questions, they all tend to be fairly straightforward knowledge questions. Why do you have to breathe more heavily when you exercise? Why are there fossils of sea creatures in the Grand Canyon? Which piece of equipment do you need to measure electrical current? So on. And on these kind of questions, boys tend to outperform girls. So to think of it another way, is it fair to say that girls are worse at thinking like scientists? Now, I can see why the OECD used this phrase, because you're trying to summarise to an audience, but you're trying to summarise what is quite a complex picture with boys doing better in this bit over here, girls doing better in this bit over here. On average, a lot of the differences are quite small anyway. But what we see from this example is the specifics of what's being tested are quite important. And this will be true, we've just talked about science here, but this will also be true in maths. We'll see later examples where boys don't outperform girls in mathematics. And uh, it, it would depend on the way you go about asking the questions and, and the content. So it just shows that a lot of sort of sweeping statements Boys are underachieving. Uh, girls can't think like scientists. Girls are bad at maths. A lot of it will depend upon the exact specifics of the way you ask the question, which group of children you're talking about, what age you're talking about, what exact skills you're talking about. makes it a, a dangerous area for making big statements. So I'm just going to summarise everything. PISA does so plenty of gender differences. I've barely scratched the surface of all the things that are in the report and indeed all the things that are in PISA I haven't talked about. Uh, attitudes to problem solving, ways they go about solving problems, playing chess, parental expectations, what they like in the class, all sorts of things, loads of gender differences. And what is surprising is how many of these are consistent across different countries, different education systems. You can also see from the data that equality, having gender equality in performance is not the same as having high performance. They are different things. You get countries with high performance and a big gender difference. You also get countries with low performance and hardly any gender difference. It's not the same thing. They need different approaches. Explanations of the difference in performance are incomplete. So there's some good ideas in terms of, get, you know, who's going to argue with getting boys to read more? It's a good idea. Who's going to argue with trying to make girls more confident in mathematics? All sensible stuff. But knowing the real impact of policy responses and whether there'll be enough to actually eradicate gender differences is, uh, is difficult and indeed leads to more questions to explain the causes. Why are girls less confident in mathematics? Where does that come from in the first place? And through all this, you've got this danger of sweeping statements missing a lot of the subtleties of differences in, uh, in, gender, in gender differences. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.